So thank you again for joining us this evening for our special panel presentation and discussion titled The Urgency of Now, Sea Level Rise in Santa Barbara and Its Effects on Our Historic and Natural Resources. The Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation recently became a founding member of the Environmental Alliance of Santa Barbara County Museums. 14 leading local museums and cultural institutions have united to creatively explore the impacts of climate change through art, history, science, or nature. The Alliance's inaugural project, Impact Climate Change and the Urgency of Now, April through September 2022, invites visitors to programs and exhibits offered by all 14 participating institutions in order to delve deeper and educate about the complex and vexing challenge that is climate change. To learn more about the Environmental Alliance of Santa Barbara County Museums, please visit sbmuseumalliance.org. As we begin this program, we want to acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our region. So let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have shown worldwide. We are on their traditional territory of the Chumash peoples. Now, it's my honor and privilege to introduce our panelists this evening, Melissa Hetrick, David Stone, and Michael Mwale. Melissa Hetrick is the Acting Energy and Climate Manager for the City of Santa Barbara. David Stone is an archaeologist and environmental planner and a professor in the US UCSB Environmental Studies Department. Michael Mwale is the Associate Executive Director for Cultural Resources here at the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. And before David and Mike begin the presentation, uh, we'd like to begin by asking you, our audience members, an icebreaker poll question. So let me go ahead and launch that poll now. So what are the major problems the Santa Barbara community will face as sea levels continue to rise? I'll give everyone a moment to participate. We've got 60%. Almost everyone. Eighty two percent. All right, I will end it here and I will let David and Mike comment on the poll and start your presentation. Wow, I, um, thank you very much, Sarah. I um, am so honored to have been asked by you to contribute to this really, really interesting discussion. And I would have checked every single question that I saw <laughs> at the poll myself. Um, it's, uh, what I'm here to do is provide some context as to what the sea level rise um, dynamic has done to archaeological sites in the last 20,000 years. And certainly uh, everything that we're looking at there in the intro poll, uh, financial economic stress from A to Z has affected uh, the prehistoric inhabitants, inhabitants of the channel. Uh, the Chumash. So it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, definitely. And Melissa was probably going to touch on this at the end, um, that all of these questions are um, 
are absolutely central. Um, Mike, did you have anything you wanted to add to that at all? No? Okay, great. So I'll just close this then. Great. So uh, I wanted to, uh, and we'll go down to uh, my first slide here. Um, I wanted to thank um, Mike and Sarah and uh, Kevin at the Trust for helping out with these slides. They were very, very influential. But I also need to make sure you all realize this is not my research. I have done archeology span almost for 40 years, but uh, the work that I am going to discuss with you is by a uh, responsible um, from several archeologists and paleo uh, environmental uh, reconstructions, primarily uh, by people who've been working in the channel for a long time. I wanna uh, call out specifically John Erlinson, um, a professor uh, at the University of Oregon who's been doing work on the Channel Islands and the mainland for over 40 years, and Doug Kennett, who is the professor at University of California, Santa Barbara, in the anthropology department, who's done quite a bit of work in uh, paleo reconstructions and uh, understanding of climate change in uh, the channel, as well as um, uh, sea level rise. So I want to point out that everything I'm about to tell you, uh, the, his, the prehistory of the Santa Barbara Channel, uh, sea level rise, climatic change, is uh, related to that period of time only up to about 2000 years ago. And what we're going to hear from Melissa a little bit later is the very, very, um, very important information in terms of sea level rise and climatic change that is absolutely um, singular to our period of time and cannot be uh, related to these changes that we've had in the past uh, 20,000 years. So what has happened in terms of climate change in the past 20,000 years since the last ice age has been a gradual warming uh, that has resulted in the glaciers melting and sea level rise um, rising over time. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit, Mike. So, um, but within this uh, general warming, there have been periods of drought and wetter periods. And this is something that's very important for us to understand. Are we in a period of drought or not? You'll look down at the, um, these two bullets here at the bottom of the screens. Um, these paleo uh, environmental reconstructions have been able to give us an idea that for long periods of time, there have been drier conditions um, between 4,000 and 2,300 years ago. And then uh, from 1,500 to 500 uh, years ago, BP being before present. And they're interspersed with wetter periods. Um, and you could see at the bottom of this slide, the last wetter period has been after five years, 500 years ago, and has extended to today. The question is, uh, as we're talking about global climate change today, are we entering another drier period that prehistoric populations have had to address in the past? One thing as archaeologists we're very interested in doing is understanding how, in our case, the Chumash peoples have adapted to these changes in climate and can we learn from them in terms of their resilience. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Mike. The next slide uh, is focusing on uh, sea level rise and uh, I'm going to be showing you some slides after these uh, general discussions to help illustrate these concepts. But um, 20,000 years ago, when uh, global warming started uh, after the last glaciation, the sea level was approximately 100 meters or 330 feet lower than we have today. And this uh, change where the sea level uh, slowly rose um, happened um, most actively up to 8,000 years ago. 
where as, as you can see in the second triangle, uh, up to 70 feet of sea level rise occurred every thousand years ago. And then we see the sea level rise slowly, uh, slowing. Um, and after, uh, in the last 8,000 years, it's been slow. And by 2,000 years ago, we are encountering the basic sea level that we are experiencing today within six to seven feet of what we see. Now, I, I identify the Northern Channel Islands in this slide because as you're going to see, um, paleo environmental reconstruction in the Santa Barbara Channel has been focused on the Channel Islands. And this is because particularly some of the oldest archeological sites that have been recorded are on the Channel Islands. And also the Channel Islands are less developed than the mainland. So the archeological record, archeological sites that we can actually um, record and interpret are in much greater uh, density and in much better condition on the Channel Islands. So this is what I'm going to uh, illustrate in the following slides. Thanks Mike, I'll go to the next one. So, what has sea level rise done to archaeological sites? And I'm just going to talk about archaeological sites. Mike is going to talk about other cultural resources, and Melissa will talk about other uh, phenomena. Uh, sea level rise has resulted in gradual, gradual uh, destruction of artifacts and cultural heritage. And I say gradual because you can see over the past 8,000 years, the amount of sea level change has been very slow, deliberate, but it has submerged archeological sites. Now, what um, sea level rise is able to do and what we're seeing most recently uh, in the last um, 50 or less years is with global climate change, um, we're getting increased severity of climatic events, storms. And these storms, uh, and their wave action uh, has really done a number on coastal bluffs in the channel and throughout the world where we archeologists find prehistoric peoples such as the Chumash in our area located in, their, in the largest permanent villages neck on the uh, bluffs, uh, particularly between the bluffs and freshwater resources, the um, streams and um, creeks. So this um, wave action has been very, very um, demonstrable. We can see that in sites in Montecito, in um, Hollister Ranch. And the other thing that's happening and really exacerbating destruction of archeological sites is storm water runoff that we have not properly guided um, to areas where uh, the runoff can be safely uh, contained and then conveyed to the ocean. And this is undercutting stream banks and infilling estuaries over time. Um, and Mike is going to be talking, I'm sure about some historical phenomenon um, where estuaries have been infilled over time. What some of the research I worked on uh, when I was younger was the uh, infilling of the Goleta Slough uh, during very, very intense storm events in the 1860s. So, okay, let's just take a look at some uh, figures here. Now, uh, Mike's gonna help me with this. This is a reconstruction. Um, these dotted lines show the extent of the landform um, 20,000 years ago. Those dotted lines are the sea level um, about 100 meters or 300 feet, 330 feet below the present surface. And you can see um, the, uh, that that is our uh, mainland uh, extent of how far a land would have gone uh, extended uh, 10, 000, um, 20,000 years ago. And you can see around the islands, the same sort of thing. Now uh, within, you see the, uh, the islands as they exist today, and you see some archeological sites that date to 11,000 years ago. So you can see that uh, the implication is many, many archeological sites have been flooded uh, because of 
um, rising sea levels over time. Thanks, let's go to the next one. And uh, this is showing two curves of the rate of sea level rise. You can see at the bottom, um, it's showing <clears throat> thousand years, uh, thousands of years ago. Um, and there's an A and a B. We'll just stick with the B curve. It's showing that um, between um, about 17,000 and 7,000 years ago, the rate of sea level rise was very, very high. And then when you get to present sea level around um, 2,000 years ago, it, it slowed down substantially. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, this is uh, just to show, again, a reconstruction of, in this case, the Channel Islands. Um, the A that you see, uh, that's the outline, is um, uh, about 15,000 years ago. And the B, which is the lighter shade, is about 10, uh, between 12 and 10,000 years ago. And you see where the islands are today. So uh, the islands were one continuous mass, and you'll see in the next slide that um, uh, these little dots that you can see here are the archeological sites that we know date to this period. So the ones that Mike are, are showing us now are um, the oldest sites on both um, Santa Cruz uh, um, and San Miguel just to the uh, left. And these are um, up to 13,000 year old sites. So uh, you could see the, where the islands are today and how large the island would have been. And this is just pointing out that what we know about these archeological sites, these little dots is just a very, very small infinitesimal, infinitesimal amount of all the archeological sites that have been submerged over time. Okay. Let's Keep on going. Uh, another, this is focusing on San Miguel Island here. And again, the little circles are the sites that we know about. And um, the grayer area surrounding these archeological sites is the landform that would have existed uh, 10,000 years ago. And it just shows you um, the extent to which uh, sea level change, uh, sea level rising has inundated sites. Okay. Moving ahead, moving ahead. And our next one, I think, is my last one. Okay, this is a very interesting map. It's very colorful. These uh, are soils or different types of soil um, formations in Santa Barbara. And Mike has got his cursor, thank you, Mike, on a, a, a pink sort of soil there. That, that is right around Milka Street, and it's extending northward to the County Bowl. These soils that you see in that nice uh, mauve color are associated with infilling of an estuary that existed uh, 20,000 years ago. And over time, sediments have filled in the estuary. And now, of course, it's part of downtown. Um, so when we're trying to reconstruct how archaeological sites may have been occupied, 10 or more thousand years, we have to understand that these estuaries have been infilled. You can see Mike will show you um, the bird refuge slightly to the east. There's another slight area where there's been infilling over time. So um, in a nutshell, you could see that sea level rise is not something new and it has substantially affected our interpretation of prehistory. Thanks, Mike. Okay, I'm going to put this into a little bit of a historic context. Um, this is a map from um, the Coast Survey of the Port of Santa Barbara. And you can see standing water in El Estero or the estuary almost in the exact same position of the soils that David just pointed out. And over here is Las Salinas or the bird refuge and, and the Mission Creek drainage. The gray area you see around the, the standing water is tidal marsh. So those areas would be inundated at high tide. Oh, 
some reason. So this is a close up of the same area and I, I point this out to illustrate um, something that happened historically. In 1818, there was a pair of earthquakes that were epicentered between San Gabriel and San Juan Capistrano that did damage to the California missions up and down the coast. And it, it also caused a tidal wave um, that was that affected numerous low-lying areas, including the Estero at Santa Barbara. And visitors' accounts talk about that tidal wave um, surging past the front gates of the Presidio. Well, they didn't mean all the way up the coast to 54 feet in elevation where the Presidio sat, which is right here. They meant that the wave advanced up the estuary all the way past the Presidio. And this area is up by uh, Anapamu and is the area around the football stadium. So as David pointed out, Milpas is on the other side of this and we'll see in some, some other images here. This is a bird's eye view of Santa Barbara as late as 1877. And you can still see, although they've projected the street grid over this area, um, there is absolutely no development in the mouth of the estuary or as far back as it goes up towards um, Santa Barbara High School and the County Bowl. So this is another coast survey map. Um, it's a sketch of the city of Santa Barbara and um, it also shows, it's, it's an 1870 survey with improvements to 1878. So you can see that the town is being built out around State Street. Um, and you can see um, the development of some of the blocks over towards the east side. But still, there is a gaping area of undevelopment that goes all the way back. There's tidal marsh symbols all the way up here at Anapamu Street. So um, as David pointed out, the, these soils um, have been deposited through a number of phenomena. Starting back in the Presidio era, you had burning and grazing and deforesting of the area, which accelerated erosion and, and accelerated the filling in of the slough margin, so that caused it to start shrinking. That continued through the 20th century, and in 1925, after the 1925 earthquake, earthquake rubble from State Street was used to, to fill that area, and eventually it was all built upon. This is a picture from 1925, and even in 1925, as downtown Santa Barbara is developing, um, you can see there, there was an agricultural exposition hall out in this area with a horse race track that you can see part of there. This is all laying in the old slough bottom, and you can still see undeveloped swaths well up towards the Riviera. All of these areas um, that you see here that are undeveloped are all more or less in the 6.6 .6 feet or two meter zone of, of elevation and, and would become inundated if the sea level was to rise to that elevation. So this is one of the hazard maps that I'm sure you'll see in Melissa's presentation following this. But again, uh, this is a very familiar pattern and it's following the old slough and um, you can see the areas along the coast that will be inundated as well. So this is a shot looking down towards East Beach. And again, you can see all of this low-lying area that eventually becomes industrial use um, is going to be subject to sea level ride inundation. And this area at the south end of the racetrack is where, uh, coincidentally, El Estero 
water treatment plant is located, which is also at um, a very low elevation. So one of the issues, I mean, in, in addition to um, the infrastructure at uh, along the coast uh, coastline um, and historic resources and prehistoric resources being lost um, is infrastructure. And you have at risk US 101, Southern Pacific Railroad, and the Santa Barbara Airport. This is a photo of the Santa Barbara Airport in January 1967. So all of these things, um, we, we have these areas that are already susceptible to flooding. And we need to start taking action to slow down sea level rise and start taking some proactive measures to protect our resources. And Santa Barbara um, has undertaken a sea level adaptation, sea level rise adaptation plan. Melissa Hetrick was the project manager for that plan. And she's going to tell us what the city is going to do about sea level rise and what measures can be taken and when. Melissa. Thanks, Michael. Let me just share my screen. Hi, all. Hi, Melissa. We're going to start with a poll. Oh, OK. We'll have you launch into your presentation. All right. So the next poll is up. What are the most effective ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the cause of sea level rise? We'll give everyone a minute to put in their answers. We've got almost everybody in. Give it a couple more seconds here. All right. Melissa, I'll let you comment on the poll and start your presentation. It looks like most people answered using greener forms of transportation and electrify our buildings. And I'm going to touch on both of those things. And oh, oh low construction, low carbon construction materials. Yeah, and you guys are on it. Um, <clears throat> Good evening, I'm Melissa Hedrick, Acting Energy and Climate Manager with the City of Santa Barbara. And the city has actually um, completed, completed one of the first climate action plans in the state in 2011 and has been planning for a sea level rise since that time. And um, there's been a number of studies over time. The most recent was a 2018 vulnerability assessment and then in two. 2021, uh, February of 2021, <clears throat> our council adopted the first um, sea level rise adaptation plan for the city. And so I'm just going to go through some of the basics of that plan and how we're implementing it now. So I think we're, we're all probably familiar with this, so the Santa Barbara shoreline, but um, when we're looking at from a planning perspective with sea level rise, the Santa Barbara shoreline, we're really considering um, 
well, three different areas really are mm -hmm. bluff areas. So our areas where we have beaches that are backed by bluffs, our low lying waterfront area, <clears throat> where we have low lying areas in back of the beaches. And that's where we have our Ellister Water Resource Center, um, <clears throat> our desalination plant and downtown. And I'll, I'll mostly be focusing on this area during this presentation, but we have done studies of, of the other areas too. And then um, our airport area is the, th is the third area. So um, I, I'll go through these historic slides pretty fast since Mike went through a lot of it, but <clears throat> Santa Barbara's shoreline in the lower downtown area has changed a lot. And this, I actually don't know the exact date of this aerial photo. I know that it's in, uh, before 1920, but um, <clears throat> if you look here, this is the area of Ledbetter and around the harbor. And if this is an aerial photo from today, and the, <clears throat> the, the dotted um, red line there is actually the old shoreline. So that's where the, the B is on this slide is the dotted red line. And, <clears throat> and so there was a huge change that happened between 1927 and 1930 to our shoreline. And that was the construction of the Harbor Breakwater and Harbor that drastically changed our shoreline and um, along our waterfront. And in addition, it actually changed the shoreline down, down close from us a lot for quite a lot, a lot of time because our harbor actually impounds um, sand that is coming down from the north. And it acts, the harbor bike water actually acts like a groin and sand um, because of that, our Ledbetter Beach is wider than it would be. West Beach is much, much wider than it would be. Um, and so even now, every year we have to dredge sand out of the harbor, the amount that gets unpounded and then put it on its way um, down coast at, at East Beach to make sure that there's sand down coast. But it just goes to show you how much a structure like the um, harbor breakwater matters when it comes to beach widths and um, erosion and flooding. So these are some of those the same maps that Michael showed you of the old El Estero that um, now has been pretty much whittled down to Laguna Creek. <laughs> so as he mentioned in the, the 1925 earthquake, um, a lot of the Estero was filled and they basically made Laguna Creek the remaining channel of that um, Estero and that empties out um, east of Stearns Wharf um, near Mission Creek. So that whole area, as Michael mentioned, is a low-lying area. And these are our FEMA flood maps now and you'll see <clears throat> that that whole, our flood maps basically are, it's the same, the same shape. <laughs> so it's the low area that when we have big rainfall events now, that area floods um, during big, big rains because it's low lying. So um, Santa Barbara has actually only experienced to date three inches of sea level rise since 1950. And that is relatively low compared to other areas um, around the world. And sea levels are not rising at the same levels around the world. And it's not that we aren't going to ex experience sea level rise, it is coming. <laughs> it is just happening at different rates um, in different places. And so I'll show you some graphs, but we've always had issues with flooding and erosion. Um, the, the slides, um, the pictures on this slide are from 1983, where we had um, a large El Nino storm event that on um, the top picture is the, is the, um, the Santa Barbara um, um, by the harbor there, the yacht club that got destroyed during that storm. The lower right hand is Stearns Wharf, which buckled during the storm. 
And then on the left-hand side, you see um, debris and flooding across Cabrillo Boulevard. So as sea level rise accelerates, um, it's anticipated that um, flood and erosion events like these will increase in both frequency and then severity. So because of that, we are starting now to plan for sea level rise. And in addition, just as a note, um, in addition to just the city wanting to be very proactive, sea level rise analysis is also required at this point for almost all coastal and um, state permitting. Anyways. So there's a bunch of factors. Uh, there's a lot of factors into how sea levels rise. And um, these include things like the Antarctic ice sheet, how it's melting. That's actually the biggest factor for the Pacific, um, how high it's rising. Um, thermal expansion from global warming, the way that um, ocean circulates and vertical land motion are all factors. And so what's happening is um, scientists are studying each of these factors. And as these new studies come about, about each of these factors, they refine um, further their projections of how sea level will rise. And so I'm sure you've all <laughs> heard every day some different idea about how sea level rise is going to happen. And that's not surprising. As we um, learn more about each of these factors, um, we change our projections just a little bit. And so because there are so many factors, there is a range of projections. And um, here on the slide, you'll see the projections that um, are for Santa Barbara. And so for lucky for me, <laughs> I do not have to wade through all the scientific studies behind these projections and um, recommend projections. What happens is um, it starts at the federal government. Our, our um, federal agency, NOAA, actually starts um, compiling projections. And then the state, um, every five years, compiles the projections for California and then recommends to us how much we should be um, planning for. So this is the range, the, the amount of sea level rise that we looked at in our plan is the blue line. And that's a very conservative line. So it has something like a one in a 200 chance of being met or exceeded. And so that's 0 0.8 feet by 2030, 2.5 feet by 2060, and 6.6 .6 feet by 2100. The lower, um, yellow or orange line um, shows a much, much more likely scenario. So something like 50% um, chance of being met or exceeded. And so there you'll see that the projections to 2030 are pretty similar, but then as you get it out um, further 2060, it's more like a foot and a half of sea level rise. And then by 2100, it's something like three feet of sea level rise. The red line on here um, was based on a previous study uh, that looked at potential for catastrophic failure of the Antarctic ice sheet. That projection has now been determined to be so low in likelihood that they've actually removed it. So anyways, knowing that projections are changing and that what actually occurs on the ground could end up even different than this, the city's approach for planning for sea level rise is to closely monitor the changes and take actions based on the amount of sea level rise we reach, as opposed to um, specific years in which it may occur, if that makes sense. So these are some of our um, hazard maps. You can actually go to our website, santabarbaraca.gov slash SLR, and there's interactive hazard maps. You can type in an address or just look at the map in general and look at different amounts of sea level rise. Um, so this is 2.5 feet of sea level rise. And so these maps only show hazards that are exacerbated by sea level rise. So for instance, this doesn't show all the flood hazards throughout the city. This only shows flooding and erosion that will be exacerbated by sea level rise. So this is 2.5 feet of sea level rise. The, the um, aqua color is tidal inundation, so that's flooding during the regular high tide. Um, the dark blue is flooding during the 100-year coastal storm, so the, 
when there's high waves. And then pink is shoreline erosion. So you'll see that by 2.5 feet of sea level rise, the impacts are really um, largely confined to south of Cabrillo Boulevard in our publicly owned um, waterfront area. And, and but that that area will experience um, a lot more storm and erosion impacts. And in particular, um, under that area, we have quite a bit of infrastructure. We have um, several sewer mains and other um, major uh, utilities that run under the beach that um, in this time frame would need to get moved or flood proofed in order to keep our wastewater system functioning. So this is six, the hazard map at 6.6 .6 feet of sea level rise. And here's where you start seeing that El Estero um, come back. <laughs> so again, the light aqua color is the is flooding during the regular high tide. So you see that extending um, up to Highway 101. And then and then you see storm flooding. So flooding during high wave events um, north of Highway 101 to about, again, the Santa Barbara High. So something to note on this map, first of all, um, this is if we do nothing. And then secondly, that area north of Highway 101, where you see the blue, that area already floods during high rainfall events. The difference under 6.6 .6 feet of sea level rise is, is that it would flood at about the same depths, but it would flood much more frequently because you'd be seeing flooding not just during high rainfall events, but also during high wave events. And then South of Highway 101, again, we would see regular uh, tidal inundation. So this map um, clearly affects um, that entire area, our, our, our railroad, um, our wastewater treatment plant. Um, just to note, as far as beach loss goes, uh, this area by the waterfront um, actually retains its beach levels for quite a bit of time and quite an amount of sea level rise. And that's mostly to do with the harbor breakwater. Um, in our bluff backed beaches, so think like thousand steps area, it's projected that by 2.5 feet of sea level rise, we will lose 80% of the beaches because essentially the bluffs will not erode back as fast as waters will rise and they'll essentially get drowned, it, drowned out. Um, so as we're looking forward into like 2.5 feet of sea level rise, we will be, um, there'll be much more pressure on uh, to utilize our waterfront beaches. So the adaptation plan considers the costs and benefits of an, a range of adaptation options, um, ranging from protecting in place, so protecting development where it is, but things like seawalls or abutments, um, moving development um, away or, or not allowing new development in hazard areas, and then also a modifying development in place. So that's things like raising um, foundations or flood proofing uh, buildings. The adaptation plan proposes guiding principles for adaptation. So these are basically policies that help us prioritize adaptation actions. And there are things like, you know, preserve basic services and health and safety or prioritize adaptation actions that help a larger number of community members versus a few and things like that. Um, and the plan basically recommends a phased approach for planning to, for sea level rise based on close monitoring of changing conditions and, and then taking different actions when certain triggers or thresholds are reached. It recommends very specific near-term actions the city could take in the next 10 years to prepare for sea level rise. And then it proposes a structure for decision-making in the mid and long-term. So the there's over, over 42 near-term actions that, that are recommended in the adaptation plan. And the highest priority 
um, of those identified in the plan to start in the next few years are, are this list. And this list really encompasses um, a lot of projects that are already needed at the city to address existing flooding issues, but that will get worse over time. So the highest priority um, projects are development of a regional shoreline monitoring program so that we can see how things are changing, but also see the success or, or not successes of projects. And um, we need to update our hazard mitigation program. We're actually almost done with that. We need to redesign and raise Laguna Tidegate. So when they um, filled El Estero and made Laguna Channel, we had to put a tide gate in there to prevent um, tidal flows from flooding lower downtown and that exists today and it needs to be raised. Um, we need to relocate the major sewer lines that are located under the beach. We need to look at optimizing and expanding our beach nourishment activities. Um, we need to raise the harbor breakwater, groins, and walkways, and potentially study triggers for closing Strins Wharf during major storm events. The other thing um, we're looking at is modifying our floodplain development regulations for new development south of Highway 101 to require flood proofing to a higher elevation. So, uh, so while I showed you a map of 6.6 .6 feet of sea level rise that showed a, a large area of flooding, really um, <clears throat> that area of flooding starts to occur somewhere around four feet or five feet of sea level rise. And so um, there's a number of decisions that need to happen in kind of the 1.5 feet of sea level rise timeframe in order to provide enough time to be ready for that, those impacts that are likely to occur around three to four feet of sea level rise. And so the type of decisions that we will need to make around 1.5 feet of sea level rise are things like whether to raise the grades around the harbor or relocate um, portions of the harbor infrastructure, whether to reconstruct, redesign, or remove Stern's Wharf, whether to allow rock revetments and silt stabilization along the bluffs to protect shoreline drive or plan for rerouting, whether to pursue large scale flood protection measures um, along our waterfront um, in order to prevent the map that. I showed you um, at 6.6 .6 feet of sea level rise would really require a number of flood, large scale flood protection measures put together. So it would require a continuous shoreline protective device or levy along our waterfront from Lightbetter Beach to the Clark Estate. <clears throat> Levees or flood walls up our major creeks along the waterfront, groundwater dewatering, and then stormwater pumps. Um, and then the other option is to relocate our flood proof facilities. And then we'll also need to decide how to adapt or relocate portions of our wastewater system and um, El Estero. So in order to make these decisions, um, luckily we do have some time again um, to make these decisions. And so really our tasks now is to prepare for those impacts that we are going to see by 2.5 feet of sea level rise, but also to gain information in order and do studies in order to be able to make these critical decisions around 1.5 feet of sea level rise. So City uh, launched in the implementation of the sea level rise plan last year, and it's being implementation of the plan is being coordinated out of our new sustainability and resilience department in coordination with um, uh, all the departments of the city. There's an interdepartmental city staff team working on this. Um, and we just actually, because we, um, have specific projects teed up from our plan. We have been very successful at getting grant funding that's coming down from the state right now for resilience projects. And we just actually got $2.1 million to start some of these sea level rise implementation projects. So we just got grant funding to work with Beacon to develop a regional shoreline monitoring program 
along um, Santa Barbara and Ventura County's shoreline. So that all our whole region would have the same information um, with which to make decisions. We've also started factoring sea level rise into our hazard buffers, development buffers and project designs by the shoreline. Um, we also got a grant to start a wastewater and water systems ad adaptation study. So that will look at um, the options to um, move those our sewer mains that I mentioned, they're located under the beach and to adapt our lower wastewater system and, and the portions of our water system that are, are co-located in that area. <clears throat> we also got funding to study um, options and curate a concept plan for raising the harbor breakwater and groins. We are looking at how we are going to adapt our waterfront area in the next 30 years to still allow for the uses that we have now there, but to make sure that um, they are protected. And then <clears throat> we're gonna be completing an airport adaptation plan. At the time we did the other um, adaptation plan, it only covered the main city. And the reason for that is that at the same time, there was a multi-jurisdictional effort to look at the whole Goleta Slough area together um, that the airport was part of. And then now that that's finished, we're going to um, fold the airport into our overall adaptation plan and take a closer look at options to adapt the airport. So I get asked a lot, what can I do now? And I, I will tell you, I don't have a slide of it up in it now, but the slide I showed you of sea level rise projections assumes that emissions um, stay steady at what they're at, they are now. There is just a certain amount of sea level rise that's likely to occur just because it's been baked into the system. But if you look at um, the sea level rise projections, for if we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the sea levels rise much slower. And so even small amounts of change to greenhouse gas emissions um, could at least buy us time um, and lower the amounts of sea level rise that we are likely to see. And so if you look at um, our carbon emissions at the city, it's that high on the right hand side where they're coming from. The majority are coming from transportation, from natural gas and use in buildings and then um, electricity. So for those of you that don't know, the city launched its own um, <clears throat> community choice energy this year. It's all called Santa Barbara Clean Energy. And so we actually buy all of our own energy. It does still come through um, Southern California Edison transmission lines, but we are buying 100% um, carbon-free electricity. And that move alone um, is the single biggest um, positive thing that we have been able to do to, for climate change with the city. It has eliminated almost instantly 20% of our emissions. But what it also um, makes us able to do is because our electricity is carbon free, so it's coming from things like solar power um, and wind power, we can electrify things like our natural gas use in buildings and our transportation modes, so electric cars, and use energy know, knowing that that additional energy, knowing that that will be carbon free. And so, <clears throat> We are currently um, comprehensively updating our climate action plan to look at additional measures for electrification and other measures to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And um, it's a, it's a um, plan that we're calling together to zero. And so I encourage everyone to take a look at that. And um, <clears throat> so this is just my contact information. Again, if you would like to look at the sea level rise plan, or the hazard maps, they're available at www.santabarbaraca.gov slash SLR. <clears throat> and then the uh, information on the climate action plan is available um, at the Together to Zero website that's on your, on your screen. And so I, I guess I would just part with stating that, especially in the city, given that you all are now consuming um, carbon-free electricity, 
the extent to which we can move our natural gas and gasoline usages to electric cars and electric stoves and electric um, heating, the, that is the single biggest thing you can do at this point in the city to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So with that, I'll stop sharing. Awesome, thank you, Melissa. Okay, we're gonna open it up to question and answer time now. So feel free to put your questions either in the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, so for David and or Mike, is relocation of archeological resources plausible or is that just too expensive? Is that something that can happen? Um, I'll, I'll start with the prehistoric aspect of that question. Really interesting. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, questioner. No, the answer is no. Unfortunately, the importance of every archaeological site is similar to a jigsaw puzzle. And each location, depth, the types of activities that occurred at that site <clears throat> help us reconstruct how the Chumash, in our case, distributed themselves over the landscape and how they changed through time. So once you move those archaeological materials from where they were originally deposited, the information that they can provide us about adaptation, about resilience, about change in lifestyles is lost. So unfortunately, they cannot be moved. They can be protected by fill, but they cannot be moved. Some historic resources could potentially be moved. Even, even historic adobes have been moved. But again, you lose um, the context of, of place, um, which is one of the contributing factors to significance. So um, it's not without cost. All right. Are the Santa Barbara airport and coastal areas better prepared now than they were in the 1960s, or are they still threatened in the same way? I'll open that up to whoever wants to answer that. I can answer to the, my limited knowledge. Um, we actually have a whole airport planning department that, that I am working with now, but um, I just came to town at 2008, so I only know a little bit, but we did do, um, I know there was several flood control projects that were done um, in the Goleta Slough area that have improved flooding um, at the airport. That said, um, the majority of the airport is in the flood zone. And I think even just in, just in the, that big storm we had like a couple of years ago, it, it flooded portions of the airport. So yeah, it's definitely, it's not as bad as it was. Um, that said, uh, we are seeing unprecedented uh, amounts of rainfalls during some of these storms. So that's changing too. And that's actually something that we're gonna be looking at in our next phase of implementation, especially at the airport area is looking at the interaction of climate changes that are causing changes in rainfall patterns and how that's interacting with what could interact with sea level rise and how that combined could affect um, flooding at the airport. But also- I'll add Melissa, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, just uh, dovetailing with exactly what you said, I was involved with the project that Caltrans and uh, Santa Barbara County Public Works completed in the last oh, five or so, 10 years, um, where the creeks of Las Vegas Creek and San Pedro Creek um, were flooding and causing 101 to be inundated. That's why it was a Caltrans issue. But that's exactly what you were talking about, Melissa, that stormwater flows and adequate um, direction of those flows in ways that don't overtop uh, creek boundaries and, and, and just in, including flooding the airport are things that are clearly uh, expensive, but uh, are very, very important for long range um, addressing flooding issues, including the airport. I know that county flood control regularly um, clears the channels 
parallel to the airport too, which, um, you know, makes them deeper, increases their flow and um, probably helps prevent some flooding to some degree. But I don't know how regularly they did that historically, but I know for the last 10 or 15 years, they go out there and dredge those. Right, there's a whole Goleta Slough management plan yeah. directed at um, sedimentation and making sure those creeks are managed well. Yeah, so that ties into this question of what actions need to be taken to protect the airport and what about UCSB? Well, that's exactly um, the purpose of the adaptation plan that we are um, presenting. So uh, the plan that was already done looked at the vulnerabilities around the Goleta Slough and looked at how changing um, management of sediment and things like that could affect flood levels. So the next step is looking at what assets at the airport are affected and how, what are our options? So I know for the near term, at least the airport is able to um, just periodically raise its runways. Um, and that is an option, but beyond that is what, what's gonna be the subject of this one. All right, we have another question. In studying these patterns of flooding over time, have there been historical patterns of neglect or resistance to making necessary changes to alleviate the impact of sea level rise, either at the community or the governance level? Well, I'll just I'll just make a state an opinion here that you know sea level rise is, is and dealing with that the way Melissa has outlined it is very very similar to large infrastructure projects that government is often resistant to in, uh, implementing because of cost and you know the costs of. Um, appropriate drainage, uh, appropriate infrastructure uh, can be substantial. And we're talking about this today in a national level, but um, are, they're necessary for long-term sustainability of how we get around and how we live day to day. So I would say, yes, I, I think our record in this country is to shy away from large capital uh, expenses um, at, at the state or federal level, even local level, because of the cost and what, you know issues that taxpayers have in funding those long-term um, programs that provide, you know, if you amortize it over 50 or 100 years, the benefits that we all now understand are absolutely critical. That's my opinion <laughs> from being an environmental planner. Yeah, I, I think David's right that it's going to take a lot of money. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that hasn't occurred though before. We have had actually periods in our history where, like, think of the entire 1930s where almost every dam in this nation was built, and there's been these huge periods of infrastructure change um, in the U.S. that have happened, and I. I also, um, just here in Santa Barbara, I mean, Cabrillo Boulevard's already been moved back twice. People just don't, uh, if you look over time. So yeah, is it gonna be hard? Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be hard, but it's, I don't think it's undoable and it's not totally unprecedented. Um, I think it happening everywhere at once is what is unprecedented, but um, definitely other communities have faced things like rising floodwaters and things like that. Mike, did you want to add anything else? I was just going to say in terms of costs um, and um, carbon footprints <clears throat> that um, adaptive reuse of buildings coming from the preservation standpoint is an excellent way to reduce carbon emissions. Um, you save carbon energy from the demolition of the structure you're replacing. 
You save carbon energy from the transportation of new materials. You save carbon energy from not using new resources. Developers frequently claim that um, adaptive reuse doesn't pencil out economically, but at some point, federal and state agencies are going to have to undertake measures to ensure that developers put the environment before profit. Um, and I think that could be in, in forms of um, some type of incentives to include natural protections. So there's my two cents. All right, let's do one last question. How much effort is being implemented towards public education regarding all of the issues discussed tonight? And how can we involve schools and student education to help involve people at different levels in the community? Okay, I'll start just from an archeological point of view. Um, I might not be the only one, but I, I do believe, uh, well, my involvement in going to schools and talking to students about prehistory and how we can learn from uh, previous occupants and how they've re um, responded to, to global climate change, to those droughts, to those wet periods. I think that is happening. I think the schools are doing a really good job, you know, in elementary, um, also all the way through high school where you have environmental science is a required uh, part of their curriculum. I, th I think students are getting a very, very clear idea of um, the responsibility that they have on their shoulders to continue with sustainability. And I, I teach environmental studies at UCSB and you know the students that are there, I ask them, how'd you become involved in environmental studies? And they say, oh, you know, through school, through, environmental science. So I think we are doing a good job um, in the schools in terms of that, but I'll be quiet and <laughs> let you guys talk too. Yeah, we are, um, we are ramping up and have already ramped up bilingual education, mostly centered around the greenhouse gas reduction um, efforts, but we'll also be folding in the sea level rise stuff. I think there's more tangible um, things to do right now for individuals in the greenhouse gas emission reduction category. And um, given that a lot of the studies and everything right now are on sea level for the eyesight involve more um, infrastructure and um, our public public lands adjacent to the shoreline. So we are, we are still um, sharing that information, but really trying to focus our education campaigns on like very concrete things that people can do. I also just want to quickly, somebody asked in the question and answer, how can I get information for up in Guadalupe for this? The county has its own um, climate plan that shows sea level rise vulnerabilities, but also you can, uh, there's a website called Our Coast, Our Future that NOAA and USGS created. And on there, you can see anywhere um, in California or anywhere in the US, um, you put in different amounts of sea level rise and look at different flooding levels and all that kind of stuff. And Mike, did you wanna add anything to that? All right, um, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, people that are interested in um, protection measures and loss of beaches, like the person that just asked about in Guadal from Guadalupe, there's a good uh, video on YouTube called Coastal Crisis, California's Vanishing Beaches. Um, and it was produced by Scott Hayes and Manuel Gomez of OC World. And it talks about um, how small beachside communities in California from San Diego to Northern California are reacting to sea level rise, including the loss of beaches um, and, and public access. So um, I encourage you to check it out. All right, awesome. I think we'll end on that. We've gone past seven o'clock. I wanna thank you all for 
coming to this special Zoom panel presentation. And thank you, David, Mike, and Melissa for your time. Um, thank you everyone so much for coming um, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.